all going to the altar of God. Even unto the God of my joy and gladness. Consent to me, O God, and defend my cause against the ungodly people, so deliver me from the deceitful and wicked men. For thou art the God of my strength. Why hast thou believed from me? And why do I so heavily want the enemy to rest with me? So send out thy light and thy truth, that they may lead me and bring me to thy holy hill into thy dwelling. Let them my hand go to the altar of God. Even unto the God of my joy and gladness. So heavy, O my soul, and heart that's in this life is within me. O put my trust in God, for I will yet give the thanks which the child of my countenance and my God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be, for all of God and Amen. I will go unto the altar of God. Even unto the God of my joy and gladness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who hath made heaven and earth. I confess, to Almighty God, to blessed Mary, ever virgin the blessed Michael the Archangel, the blessed John Baptist, the holy apostles Peter and Paul, all the saints, and thee, my brethren, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I beg, blessed Mary, ever virgin, blessed Michael the Archangel, blessed John Baptist, the holy apostles Peter and Paul, all the angels and saints, and thee, my brethren, to pray for me, the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy upon me, forgive me thy sins, and bring me to the rocks of life. Amen. I confess, O Almighty God, to the blessed Mary of the Virgin, to the blessed Mike the Archangel, to the blessed John the Baptist, to the holy apostles Peter and Paul, to all the saints, and to the Father, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed. I am all, 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 I am all. sins and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto us pardon, absolution, and remission of our sins. Amen. Will thou not turn again and quicken us, O God? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord. And grant us thy salvation. Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to thee. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. 
us pray. O oh God, who in a wonderful sacrament hast left unto us a memorial of thy passion, grant us, we beseech thee, so to venerate the sacred mysteries of thy body and blood, that we may ever know within ourselves the fruit of thy redemption, who livest and reignest with the Father in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen.
you shall remember all the ways which the Lord your God has led you, testing you to know what was in your heart. May the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. That message is posed, the question is posed by the Holy Spirit through Moses. We back the first five books of the Bible, Deuteronomy specifically, you shall remember all the ways which the Lord your God has led you, testing you to know what is in your heart. We don't like this talk about testing and proving. Oh, that was for back in the old days. But nope, it wasn't. We do not have history lessons. We do not just have church stories from the Old Testament. They are for us. And we want to never lose sight of the fact that our Lord does throughout our lives, which is our Exodus experience, test us to prove, as he says, to know what is in your heart. Basically, the question to be answered is, is your focus on things of this world or is your focus on things of the next? And it can be proved. It can be proved by the way we react to the circumstances of life. Today is the external solemnity of Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. The actual day, it was last Thursday. This is the external solemnity. I usually get bent out of shape about transferring days, but I look at it this way. The more you can talk about the Eucharist, the better. So Thursday, today. I just mentioned the circumstances of life. As we go through life, it is a constant test. And I harp a whole lot on a practical Catholic life. Or practical Catholic life sounds so dry, so analytical. A Eucharistic life would be better. But then even if you present it that way, a Eucharistic life sounds just so churchy. Do we really understand what we mean when we say living a Eucharistic life? Well, we should. It doesn't have anything to do with your being able to articulate the real presence of our Lord in the sacrament, the different ways in its manifest, the sacrifice, the Eucharist, communion, or even the whole, you know, the discussion of the real presence and the objective nature of our Lord being with us in the sacrament of the altar. Basically, all of those things that we should know and must know as Catholics, we must as Catholics believe in what we refer to as transubstantiation, that after the words of consecration, bread and wine no longer exist in any way, shape, or form on the altar. It is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Savior. The question is whether you believe that. Do you believe that bread and wine no longer exist? Not just believe in your head, I would submit even more so, do you act like you believe that God, Almighty himself, is on our altars after the words of consecration? It is a test. It's the ultimate test. The tests of life, of which I spoke before, uh, that uh, Moses points out, you know, our Lord does put us in circumstance. And a lot of people look at the test as when bad things happen. Loss of a loved one, sickness, you know, bad financial times, bad employment times. Yeah, those are tests. However, so are good times. Whether it be want or prosperity, we are always being tested. When those bad things happen, which, praise God, are rare, you know, more or less, depending on situations. They're rare, but how do we deal with them? Do we shake our fist at God when they happen? Or do we appeal to him to give us solace through the events? Good times are also tests for us, particularly in our culture. Yeah, look at our culture. We've got so much more than we need. 
so much more than we need. You know, it's kind of nice to sit back and look, you know, I grouse about this, that, and the other thing around, but generally speaking, everybody's pretty well happy, everything's going well for the vast majority of people. When things are going well for us in our lives, which, as I said, generally they are well, that's a test. When things are absolutely great, when the money's rolling in, good job, none of the kids are acting up, mommy and daddy are friends, everything's just peachy, okay? Do we take that for granted? Or do we thank God for it? Do we thank God for it and do we for a second think to go, Lord, I appreciate everything that's going well right now, uh, but please strengthen me because I know that it's not always going to be this way. It's not always going to be that way. It's not always going to be, whether it be bad or good, no matter what the situation is, it's fleeting. Absolutely fleeting. The good is not always going to be good. The bad is not always going to be bad. Yes, that's just the way we have to look. But are we presumptuous about this whole thing? Those are all tests as you go through your life. For us as Christians, the primary chest of our faith is the Eucharist. Because God asks us something. In this whole deal with testing is, are you going to focus on the things here in this place, or are you going to focus on me and what I have promised you and what I said? No matter how bad it may look there, keep your eyes on me because this awaits you. The bad stuff is fleeting, the good stuff is fleeting, your eternal salvation is permanent. Are you going to focus here or there? That's the whole deal with man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. Notice everything, not just the Ten Commandments, not just the parts we like, everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's not talking about food. He's talking about stuff in this world. Man does not live by that stuff. It's a benefit to him. It's a good thing if it's going on well, but you don't live by that. You live by everything that proceeds from my mouth. Obedience to my words. When he talks about food, he is talking about things, temporal. God can sustain us without those things. I mean, even food, if you want to get down to brass tacks. Moses, when he went to get the Ten Commandments, 40 days he was up there. Didn't eat or drink. He was just fine. Elijah, same thing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, 40 days in the wilderness. He did not eat or he did not drink. Somebody actually asked me a couple weeks ago about that. They said, well, wasn't our Lord bound to the natural law? Yes, he is. That's what made his temptations and sufferings just that much more horrible. Because where we would die after four or five days, maybe for those who are strong, a week without food and water, we would just die. Our Lord just kept getting hungrier and more thirsty until it was over because God sustained him. If God sustained Moses and Elijah, human prophets, you don't think he can sustain his son. God can sustain us without things. A lot of the things we think we need, we don't. Well, you need a roof over your head, you need shelter. No, you don't, okay? Prime, I could be a prime example of that. I was in the Marine Corps for four and a half years. You know, I have slept in creeks, you know? You get tired enough, you're, you're all about laying down in a creek while water's running on you and sleeping for a couple minutes, all right? You don't need a roof over your head. It's nice, but you don't need it. It's a necessity. No, it's not. Praise God if you have one, okay? God sustains us. That's what he wants us to understand. And as his people, the ultimate test is a... Do you really believe what I say, or do you believe what you see, or do you believe what you feel and think? 
it's the Eucharist. It is the ultimate test for us. Our Lord is unequivocal in his presentation of what the Eucharist is. That reading from the gospel today, how explicit, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in. He doesn't talk one word about symbology. He doesn't talk anything about analogies. He talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He was so emphatic and so explicit about it, the Jews went, come on, how do you give us your flesh to eat and your blood to drink? And he keeps harping on it and harping on it. And it wasn't that long of a gospel. Read John chapter 6 when you get home. It's more and more and more detailed. He says, my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Not symbolically, not as an illustration of something. Indeed. This is real, folks. I'm saying this. Jews, you don't get it. Everybody else that's hanging around, they don't get it. They up and leave. And our Lord Jesus looks at the 12 who are staying back and goes, he did, hey, I can't believe they took me seriously about that. Go get them. Bring them back. I'm talking symbolically. No, he looks at them and says, are you going to leave too? Peter, I paraphrase, we don't get it. Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. I just believe, Lord. That is the answer that he wants from us when he talks about the Eucharist. Because you look at the grand scheme of things, look at the answers that he gets to that test. This is my body. This is my blood. Look at the millions of people who call themselves Christians and are not in the Catholic Church. They deny it outright. Out and out deny it. Westminster Confession of Faith. Presbyterians love that one. That's their confession of faith. Specifically, nothing happens to the forms. Nothing happens to the bread and wine. This is all spiritual. Nothing happens. That contradicts our Lord Jesus Christ to his face. The one who says, my flesh is is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. What the Holy Spirit spoke through St. Paul after our Lord's resurrection and ascension into heaven is not partaking of the bread, partaking of the body of our Lord, is not partaking of the cup, participation in the blood of our Lord. Doesn't mention one word about symbolic. But millions, literally millions, of Christians deny the words of our Lord. It's in the tenets of their belief. He says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. That's awful bold to say. We don't believe we eat his flesh and drink his blood. That's awful bold. Oh yeah, there's Protestants. What about Catholics? What about Catholics? I was talking to someone several months ago, and in the conversation, she referred to the Blessed Sacrament as wafers. Time and time and time. I finally, you know, I try to be nice, you know, and not come off too up in your face, hard to believe, occasionally. And I, it just went, to, I just, I, I said, oh, hold on, I said, they're not wafers. It's God. You know? It, you, yeah, this person dropped a wafer and this person dropped wafers all over. The, that's a Catholic. That's a Catholic who doesn't know the first thing about their faith. No such thing. Now, what's over on that table right now are wafers. It's altar bread. They are not hosts. They are not hosts. They are not victims until the words of consecration. After the words of consecration, it's divinity. And we have to understand that it is divinity, that we take into ourselves. 
part of the test is not, well, yeah, I go to Mass, and I, yeah, we hear all the time about the body, blood, soul, and divinity. Do you act like it? You know, think back to other parishes. and we, Do people act like they are coming up and going to truly, really receive God into their very beings? Do they act like that? Oh, no, I'm just going to waltz up and I'm going to talk to my friends there and I'm going to shake hands and then I'm going to put God in my grubby little mitts when I get up there. You could not even remotely understand what's going on to approach our Lord like that. You could not. Last week was Trinity Sunday. We talked about the Trinity. Incomprehensible. Can never get it. It's the Trinity. Three and one, one and three. You take that Trinity into yourself, that incomprehensible Godhead, you take into yourself at the Eucharist, and how is he approached? That's part of the test. We better have the right answer. Do we understand when we speak of the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Mass, communion, do we actually know what, are those just synonyms that we use for, you know, those are just words that mean the ritual when everybody gets up and comes up and receives. For one thing, everybody ought not get up and come up and receive. It's a very individual thing. You need to be individually, properly disposed to receive our Lord. But do you understand what those words mean? The sacrifice of the Mass. Every time we come together and offer the Holy Sacrifice, it is a representation of our Lord's sacrifice on Calvary. And as I always say, the barriers of time and space go away. We are back on Calvary. Calvary is here. Eternity comes into our midst. We don't sacrifice our Lord again. That was once for all. We represent that sacrifice of the Father. It's the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It's not coming together and reenacting the Lord's Supper. That is not what the Mass is. When we say the word Eucharist, do, do people even know that? I say about half people, Eucharist. Well, that's communion. Eucharist means thanksgiving. It means thanksgiving. We are giving thanks to God for what his son did for us on the cross and bringing it forward to us, to let us participate in that. Our Lord set that stage. He took bread and giving thanks. He took the cup and again he gave thanks. That's what we're doing when we're here. We are giving thanks. It is the Eucharist, the thanksgiving for the sacrifice. And this is one that really is misunderstood is communion. Well, God wanted us to have communion. That means everybody can... No, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, it means just the opposite. The Catechism of the Council of Trent says that the Holy Communion is what reconciles and unites us to one another in the same Christ and forms us into one body. One body. One body. The one holy Catholic and apostolic church. One. If you are not in it, you are not in communion. If you are not in communion, you must not receive it. Again, we're falling way short of this understanding. Communion. Oh, you know, that means if you go to church, that's the time whenever, every time we have a wedding or a funeral, particularly funerals, I sit up here, stand up here, and it, I don't know, if, if you're a Roman Catholic, you, you can't do that. People just don't get it. I stand up here and I say, you must be a Roman Catholic. That means you must be a baptized and confirmed Roman Catholic. You must understand that the Pope has universal jurisdiction over the church. You have to be in communion with him. You have to have gone to sacramental confession within the past calendar year. You have had to observe the Eucharistic fast or do not come up to communion. I have looked people dead in the face who I knew their proclivities, I knew they weren't Catholics, said those words, 
and had them come up to this altar rail. And then look at me like I slap them in the face when I don't give them communion. You're not in communion, you can't receive it. I want your communion, but I don't want to be in communion. And you get no sympathy from any of us who were back in the day when we went through what we went through to get either into communion or back into communion with the Holy Catholic Church so we could receive communion. Because we weren't in communion, we realized that. But others who left this place and then show up here for funerals, they want to take advantage. They didn't have to sacrifice like we did, and they want to take advantage of it. You have to be in communion. People don't get it. And you know what's bad about it? We foster that in a lot of people. I showed up at Nemours one day, and the lady standing behind the desk, volunteer, says, You're Roman Catholic, right, Father? Yes. Can anybody come to your Mass? Absolutely. No, I mean, can everybody receive communion? Absolutely not. You have to be a Roman Catholic. I could tell that it wasn't a Roman Catholic. For one thing, they wouldn't ask me those questions. I said, no, you got to be a Roman Catholic. Why? Because people that aren't Roman Catholics don't believe what the Roman Catholic teaches about communion. I'm an Episcopalian. Okay, you can't receive. Well, I don't believe that's true. You just made my point. You don't believe what we believe. Okay, duh. All right. But then what do I get? I go to St. Phil in the Blanks, and Father knows I'm an Episcopalian, and he gives me communion all the time. Very rarely, I always try to be ironic when I hear stories like Father says this and Father says, oh, I don't know what the conversation was, I don't know context, I don't want to say what the... I could look that one dead in the face and go, Father is wrong. Father is dead wrong. Father is blaspheming the Blessed Sacrament. All right? We had a little incident, we were setting up in the office one day and we were talking about a, an abominable website from a parish, and it said, all are welcome. All can receive communion and live one big happy family. They couldn't really mean that. So did a little spying and somebody in the office called and said, hey, I'm visiting and I was just, I have some Protestant friends. And yeah, they can come, they go, no, can they receive communion? Yes, it doesn't make any difference. We don't care about that. We're fostering that kind of stuff when we should be standing firm for what the Catholic Church, what true communion is. Because all these people look like we're being arrogant toward them and belligerent. I want to give you communion more than you can ever imagine. But you gotta be, you gotta do your part and become a Catholic. You want to receive communion, you have to be in communion. It is about the bread and the word, everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. Those two things are what make us live a supernatural life. If you don't have either one of those things, you don't have a supernatural life. Those are the words of St. Jose Maria Escriva. He says, and I quote, bread and word, without these, you won't live a supernatural life. We need both of those things. It's a test. Do you believe what I say or what you see? Because our faith is a supernatural faith. It is not bound to this world, and we got to start appreciating it, and he wants us to appreciate it in this world, and he tests us to see if we do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty.
Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church in the world. Almighty and ever living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and give thanks for all men. Receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, Francis our Pope, Stephen our Bishop, His Holiness Benedict XVI, John the Bishop of Orlando, and to all bishops and other sacred ministers that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, to rejoicing in thy whole creation. They may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Every most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants, departed this life in thy faith and fear. We seek thee to be merciful and grant the fullness of joy in thy love and service, and to grant us grace, so to follow the good examples of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake. Our mediator and advocate to thee and the Holy Ghost, we all honor and glory. Amen. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith, make your humble confession, Almighty God, be we kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God, Father, Father, God, Lord Jesus Christ. Maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and do well our animal sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed, by thought, word, and deed, and against thy divine majesty. For though we most justly have our act in the nation against us, we do earnestly repent, and our heart is sorry to please our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Savior Christ said to all that truly turn to him, Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish and have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul said, This is a true saying worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John said, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins.
Pray, brethren, that this, my sacrifice and yours, may be acceptable unto God the Father Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of thy hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all the Holy Church. We beseech thee, O Lord, that like as we in these our oblations do show forth in a mystery the unity and concord of thy church, so thou wouldest ever mercifully bestow upon her these thy blessings through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with our spirits. Lift up your heart. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God.
we beseech thee that our Lord graciously to accept this oblation from us, thy servants, and from thy whole family. Order thou our days in thy peace, and bid us to be delivered from eternal damnation, enough with the fold of thy elect. Vouchsafe, O God, we beseech thee in all things, to make this oblation blessed, approve and accept a perfect and worthy offer, that it may become for us the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Who the day before he suffered took bread into his holy and venerable hands and with eyes lifted up to heaven unto thee, God his almighty Father, giving thanks to thee, he blessed broke and gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you Likewise, after supper, taking also this goodly chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again giving thanks to thee, he blessed and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, we proclaim thy death, O Lord, Lord and the rest of thy Wherefore, O Lord, we thy servants and thy holy people also, remembering the blessed passion of the same Christ, thy Son, our Lord, as also his resurrection from the dead and his glorious ascension into heaven, to offer unto thine excellent majesty of thine own gifts and bounty, the pure victim, the holy victim, the Immaculate Victim, the Holy Bread of Eternal Life, and the Chalice of Everlasting Salvation. Thou say to look upon them with a merciful and pleasant countenance, and to accept, even as thou didst thou say to accept the gifts of thy servant Abel the Righteous, and sacrifice of our patriarch Abraham, the Holy Sacrifice, the Immaculate Victim, which thou hast priest Melchizedek offered unto thee. We humbly beseech thee, Almighty God, command these offerings to be brought by the hands of thy holy angels to thine altar on high, in sight of thy divine majesty, that all we who at this partaking of the altar shall receive the most sacred body and blood of thy Son, may be fulfilled with all heavenly benediction and grace. Remember also, O Lord, thy servants and handmaids who have gone before us, sealed with the seal of faith, to sleep the sleeps of peace. Thinking this day especially of our faithful fathers departed. To them, O Lord, and to all that rest in Christ, we beseech thee to grant the abode of refreshing of life and of peace. To us sinners also, my servants who hope in the multitude of thy mercies, 
Thou save to grant some heart and fellowship with thy holy apostles and martyrs, with John, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicitas, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and with all thy saints within whose fellowship we beseech thee amid us, not weighing our merit, but granting us forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom, O Lord, thou dost ever create all these things, dost sanctify, quicken, bless, and bestow them upon. By whom, and with whom, and in whom, <coughs> to the O Father Almighty, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, we all honor and glory throughout all ages, world without end.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him that taketh away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy to
the ever living God. We most are. Thank thee. Thank thee. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. The Mass is ended to depart in peace. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The beginning of the Holy Gospel according to St. John the Divine. Glory be to thee, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And it was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through Him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which light of every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is to the only begotten of the Father, who of grace and truth. Amen. 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 